Welcome to our class on user interface design and evaluation. So in today's class, we're going to get into what are the parts of a computer system that you see and interact with, okay, the user interface. How do people have user experiences, oftentimes they're called, uh, with software. Now from an administrative, administrative perspective, I want to remind you about the analytics project. So that will be due uh, before too long. Check the syllabus and make sure that you're working on that. Also, I want to make you aware of the upcoming exam. So this class period is scheduled and then the um, next class will be in the class. We'll be doing an activity and also reviewing for the exam, but the exam is coming up soon. So please uh, be aware of that and, and study appropriately. Now I want to I wanna briefly talk about um, the importance of the user interface. There's a, a Dilbert cartoon that I'll link uh, in the description here, but uh, the inter user interface is very important. Uh, for most people, when they think about a particular type of software or a particular an app or a particular thing, they, they really are thinking about the user interface. Well, what's the difference between an iPhone and between an Android phone? Oh, well, it, it, it looks different. You know, what, what are the problems with the healthcare.gov system? Well, it was the website, right? When in reality, the you know the what goes on behind the scenes may be far more important in terms of you know what actually the functionality of the system is, but the user interface is just really really important uh, for uh, for users uh, to understand and to to know how they interact with the system and how they evaluate the system. So there's a a Dilbert comic um, where Dilbert is giving a technology demo. He tells, I'll, I'll link this, but uh, he, he says that the, the software isn't 100% complete. Uh, if, you had a, if it had a user interface, you'd see something here and here and here, and then you'd be saying, I got to get me some of that. Uh, and this points out, even in a Dilbert comic, that you know, the user interface really is you know, the part that makes people desire uh, a, a system, love or hate a, a computer system. All right, so we're going to spend a fair amount of our time talking about uh, the this gentleman, uh, Jacob Nielsen, uh, and he, he has a list of 10 user interface design heuristics. These are heuristics, if you're not familiar with that term, it means a rule of thumb. So these are rules of thumb around how you should do uh, or not do uh, user interface design. And Nielsen is a kind of a self-proclaimed guru on user interface design and people pay attention uh, to him. He's, he's been very influential. There's other people who are also influential in this field. Johnny Ive, for example, from Apple and, and others. Uh, but, you know, not everyone agrees with Nielsen, but I think he makes some pretty good points. And so uh, these these 10 user interface design heuristics, I, I think, are important and are, you know, seem to always make their way into the exams. So let's walk through them one at a time. The first has to do with the visibility of the system status. Now, have you ever used a system, you know, or a website or something like that, and you click on a button or you do something in the system, and then you don't really know if it's working or not? You wait, you think you clicked it, maybe it's working, maybe it's thinking, maybe it's processing, maybe it's not. Uh, so in a good user interface, the user should always have visibility of the system status, meaning they should always know whether the system is doing something or not. If you click a button and it's going to take some time, there should be a visual cue that helps the user know, oh, okay, well, this is going to take a while to upload or to process or to copy or to do whatever. And so oftentimes we have things like uh, on the screen, we have progress bars, we have, uh, you know, on certain you know, sometimes the mouse changes uh, to be, you know, an hourglass or a spinning wheel or something like that. And so we, we have some indication that, that something's happening, the system's working, and the user isn't left to just imagine, you know, hey, is this working? Is it broken? Is it frozen? What's going on? That's number one. Number two has to do with a match between the system and the real world. And there is a little bit of controversy on whether this should be the case or whether it shouldn't. Uh, but it's still an important, even historical um, design heuristic. So let's talk about it for a bit. The idea here is that we often use metaphors or examples from the real world to help us understand how to use technology. 
Now, part of this is because as technologies are introduced, sometimes we just don't, we don't get them and people don't understand them. You know, you, you talk to, you know, your grandparents, if they're, if they're still around and, you know, they understand technology differently than, than you do. Uh, you know, kids understand technology oftentimes more than, than we do. And so it's just, different because our metaphors are different and we grow up sometimes with the metaphors and don't even think about them. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. So what do we have here? This metaphor shows a table or a desk with a phone on it, with some pictures on it, some documents on it, and this represents this the most dominant metaphor in user interface design over the last 30 years, this concept of a desktop. Right? So when we use a computer, we have our desktop. We take our files out and we uh, you know, open our files. If we open a second file, it goes on top of that first file and we can then view it if we want to shuffle them around. We also oftentimes have you know, a place where we can put f uh, files that we don't want to see anymore or that we want to get rid of. And so this metaphor, the desktop metaphor, is extremely important uh, and has been, like I said, the dominant metaphor on PCs and laptops for a very long time. Here's some other metaphors. So in the upper the upper left hand corner, we have we have this one. We have the metaphor of the trash can or the recycle bin. How would we you know how would we know how to get rid of files? You know we used to just you know, type a command to remove a file, uh, but how, you know, from a from user's perspective, they were concerned with this, and and so how do we get rid of files now? Well, we put them in this particular location, which is the same as where we use to get rid of garbage that we don't want anymore. And if we really want to, uh, we can go dumpster diving and get uh, get our files out of there if we decide that we don't want to uh, get rid of those files. So that is one metaphor, this, this garbage can or recycle bin. Now the second one up on the top, this box right here, see if you can think about what this, this box is called that is asking you questions and, and wanting you to uh, respond with a particular answer. If you haven't heard of the name of this before, these are actually called dialogue boxes. So the metaphor here is that your computer is talking to you and wants to have a conversation with you. It wants to ask you questions and let you have the opportunity to respond with various different answers. That's another metaphor that we use as we interact with systems. Now this uh, one in the bottom left hand corner, it's maybe a little more obscure. Uh, this one is the idea of breadcrumbs. Now if you if you've used breadcrumb, or if you've uh, thought about breadcrumbs before, there's a very common nursery or a fairy tale uh, involving breadcrumbs. And so, if you haven't heard the story before, uh, the story of Hansel and Gretel involves breadcrumbs, and they lay down the breadcrumbs as they're walking, so that uh, on their return trip they'll know where they've been and they can go and return home again. So breadcrumbs are based off of that metaphor that we can see where we've been and see where we need to go. Let me show you an example of this. So if we're on SAC CT. Let me pull up SAC CT. Here's SAC CT. Uh, we're in our class page, and I've, I've navigated into the course material folder, and inside of that folder, there's another folder called the slides folder, and then here's the content. But one thing you might notice in the in the upper left hand corner below the main menu, we have course material, and then sort of this little arrow, and then slides. This user interface design is called breadcrumbs because it allows us to see one where we're at and two to navigate back to where we were at originally. Okay, so those are an example of breadcrumbs. Now this the second uh, one in the mid or so the one in the middle on the bottom row is a type of buttons. Now I don't know if anyone has a uh, radio like this anymore. Some of you might have buttons like this, but if you've never experienced this before, the way that these buttons worked is you had various preset stations, and you could only press one of these buttons at a time. So if you pressed, let's say, this middle button right here and selected an AM station, if you then wanted to switch and select a different button, you'd press it in, and then the middle button would pop out. Only one of those is allowed to be uh, pressed at a time. 
So this has led to another user interface design um, called radio buttons. Radio buttons look, let me pull up some radio buttons. Here we go, here's some radio buttons. Radio buttons look something like this. They have multiple options, but you're only allowed to choose one of those options. If you change your mind and select a different option, it automatically deselects the other option out of the group and selects the new option. And this last one is the clipboard. What do we do with clipboards? Well, we write things on there that we might use as we're taking notes or, you know, when we're doing something else, perhaps we're, you know, we're taking some quick notes. And so this concept of a clipboard where something that we have, you know, wanted to store temporarily goes onto the clipboard and we can use it. And so whenever you copy and paste something uh, in many operating systems, it goes onto something called the clipboard. Let's look at a few others. All right, so some of these are a little more obvious and some of them are a little more obscure. Let's, let's start on the bottom row now. So this, this, uh, this bottom left example is very common. So the idea of having a filing cabinet and folders and files within those folders is a very common metaphor on most operating systems. Now some of those operating systems, for example, iOS with Apple, uh, is trying to go away a little bit from this metaphor. Uh, it's hard to deal with files and folders on an iPhone or an iPad. Uh, Apple tries to hide that from you because they're trying to move away from that metaphor. But on most operating systems, the concept of folders and files uh, within a, a drive or a file cabinet is very common. On the bottom right, uh, this is the dominant e-commerce metaphor. This concept of putting items that you want to purchase into a cart, shopping cart, uh, and then when you go to check out to purchase, you take all of the items in your shopping part, cart and you can adjust what's in there and what's not in there, uh, and then you make your transaction. That's a very dominant metaphor. These other two, two are a little more obscure. So in the upper left, we have a very old tablet, okay? So this is an idea of a single flat, uh, in this case, stone, where information is written on. And now we have the concept of tablets, uh, tablet computers, where we have a single you know, flat slate uh, where we can oftentimes write and manipulate information on those. On the upper right, we have this idea of a scroll. Now on a scroll like this, especially an older scroll, how do you, how do you uh, find information that's covered up, that's, you know, that's hidden in this you know, area over here, over here? Well, you need to roll and scroll to the left and to the right. And so our concept of scrolling, we use that term, even though it doesn't really make a lot of sense to us, our concept of scrolling comes from this metaphor. All right, the last one I want to talk about, because it's becoming more and more popular on uh, mobile devices, is this idea of note cards. And so card-based interfaces, card-based metaphors are becoming extremely popular. Uh, some of the big apps out there for mobile, you know, Facebook, for example, Pinterest, others out there, Google does a lot of with cards, uh, have started to become kind of one of the more popular and, and most important metaphors. Uh, on the, on the mobile uh, side of things, whereas the desktop isn't as common of a metaphor on mobile devices, cards and some other metaphors are becoming very popular. All right, so that's number two. The second one, I'm sorry, not the second one, the third one is user control and freedom. Now, there's a number of different ways we can look at this, but user control and freedom has to do with the idea that users should be able to make decisions about what they're doing. They should be able to navigate around your system, your application, your user interface as they see fit. They shouldn't be forced to go a particular path. A good example of this is this concept of undo and redo. So what if you make an error in the system or you just don't like what you did? you should be able to go back and fix things. You should have the control and the freedom to go back to a previous state. Or if you, you know, want to do a particular task, you shouldn't be limited from doing a particular task. Okay, so that's, that's user control and freedom. Users should be able uh, to do what they would like with the system. Number four has to do with consistency and standards. 
If you've ever been to a website or used a particular piece of software that doesn't follow the normal rules, it can be very frustrating. It can be hard to go and figure out, okay, where, where do I go to save or to print or to do various things? Where, you know, And so following standards and being consistent, especially within your system, within your application, uh, is really important. Now, whether you love them or not, one example of this is Microsoft has introduced the ribbon design. So in all of their Office products, if you're in uh, Microsoft Word or Excel or PowerPoint in any of the new ones, there is a very similar ribbon interface. And even on the Windows side of things, Microsoft has started to add the ribbon to some common applications like Paint and Notepad and others in the newer, newer versions of Windows to, be a, to have a consistent um, user interface for its users. Another example of this, I don't know if you can quite see it on the page, uh, is this symbol. Hopefully I can circle it. And here it is up here again. What is that symbol? Who, how many of you are carrying around a three and a half inch floppy disk nowadays? Or even have a computer that you can put a three and a half inch floppy disk into it? Probably very few of you. But why do we use this symbol to represent saving. Well, it's because that was the common metaphor at the time where we would use this floppy disk and we wanted to save the file there. And out of the uh, a need to be consistent and to follow the standards, this symbol has remained over time. Another example of this is uh, this image on the far right. If you're familiar with this, on iOS, uh, iPhone and iPad uh, applications, this is the standard template for creating an icon for an uh, for iPhone or for an iPad. And so applications are supposed to follow this general idea, uh, this general template, so that they can center and keep their app uh, logo uh, to be s symmetrical. And so you'll notice that most not all, but most um, applications on iOS and um, on iPod, iPhones and, and, and iPad devices uh, will have app uh, logos that f follow this template. Otherwise, their apps get kind of rejected from the App Store. Number five is error prevention. So it is a great design heuristic. If you can tell your users some information that will stop them from committing an error before they even happen. Now this, this picture on here is, is, is a, a fictitious one. It's, it's a humorous one uh, asking if you uh, really, really want to post this particular information to Facebook. Um, but some applications do similar things. For example, there are many mail email programs that if you use the word attach or attachment in your email body and you don't attach a file to the email, they will give you a warning message when you push send and say, hey, are you sure you want to send this message? Uh, it seems like you want to attach something, but there's nothing attached. Are you sure you want to do that? So out, some of the newer versions of Outlook and some of the other uh, email programs do this. And this is to help users uh, to prevent errors before they even happen in the first place. Number six is this concept of recognition rather than recall. There's some fairly good science out there that says that people just can't keep very many items in their short-term memories. On average, there are some outliers in here, but uh, on average, if you ask people to keep numbers and memorize numbers and then keep giving them more and more and more numbers, on average, people will remember seven plus or minus two uh, things in their short-term memory, pieces of information. So what that means is that, you know, if you're expecting people to remember how to navigate your site or how to use something, it's really difficult for people to do that, especially if you've got to remember things from previous user interface screens. Instead, though, if you can make recognition rather than recall, meaning that they can view the screen and just recognize where they should go or what they should do, that's even better. An example of that is on the right, uh, the image on the right. It used to be that in older word processing programs, WordPerfect and earlier versions of Microsoft Word and other, other word processing programs, that you'd have to kind of remember what the fonts looked like. So you'd highlight your text and you'd go and select a new font, but it would just be a list of the names of the fonts. 
and you'd have to kind of go, oh, okay, well, Times New Roman, that's the kind of boring one that everyone used for printing. Oh, Arial, okay, I know what that one looks like. Uh, what was that weird curvy one? I don't know. Uh, and so you have to think about it. Whereas in newer versions of Office, as the image shows, it shows you a little preview of what that particular font looks like so you can recognize which font you want rather than remember which one looks like uh, the one that you want. Number seven is flexibility and efficiency of use. The idea here is uh, it's similar to the, uh, the user control and freedom. But this one differs in the fact that with flexibility and efficiency of use, we want to allow our power users, our most experienced users, to be able to use the system or use the user interface as quickly and efficiently as possible. Which means we might allow for alternative mechanisms for performing the same task. The easiest example of this is keyboard shortcuts. So for example, you can go and do something in a, a system by selecting you know, one of the menu items, file, edit, etc., uh, and then selecting the sub-menu uh, item that you want. Or, in some cases, you might be able to just use a keyboard combination. For example, some of the most common keyboard combinations are to cut, copy, and paste. And most software applications use uh, on Windows Control X, Control C, Control uh, V to perform copy and paste it, uh, pasting. Uh, similar keyboard shortcuts exist on, on a Mac. I remember distinctly for, for my uh, dissertation research uh, that I was doing, there was one application that I needed to use and I needed to do a lot of copying and pasting. But that particular piece of software did not support keyboard shortcuts. You could copy and paste, but you had to use the file menus. You had to use the mouse in order to select it. It is one of the most frustrating pieces of software I have ever used, and I had to use it. It was the only option available to me for this particular purpose. But the user interface was not a, it was not a good experience interacting with the user interface because it didn't have uh, the keyboard shortcuts I'm used to using uh, in other programs. Number eight is aesthetic and minimalist design. So the idea here is we want to not have a cluttered interface. Now there's some disagreement on this. Some people really like information dense interfaces where they can see a lot of information all at once. But generally the recommendation is to allow for a minimalist design where users can then go and get more information if they want some more information. So I put the example up here of a weather application. It was very common, especially as mobile apps were first coming online, it was very common for weather applications to just throw everything into the user interface. You could see the barometric pressure and the wind speed and direction and the precipitation and the 10-day forecast and you know everything you could possibly want to know about the weather all on one screen. And it just got very jumbled and hard to read and hard to understand uh, because there's so much on the screen. And, and at that point in time, the, the screens didn't have very high resolution. And then over time, a lot of these applications have started to adopt more of a minimalist uh, and to most people's uh, preferences, a more aesthetically or pretty uh, looking interfaces. They're just less cluttered. So you can see at a glance kind of what the what the key information is, you know, things like temperature and overall, uh, you know, weather, whether it's sunny or raining. Uh, but if you want to go and get more information on the forecasting and the barometric pressure and wind speed and all of those things, then you can drill down and get some more information. Now, Apple is very famous for their aesthetic and minimalist design. If you go to their website, uh, you can go and see, pull it up quickly, you can see that it's considered very simple. Right? There's lots of images, um, but the actual interface is, is very simple. You can go and check out their watches, and the interface is, you know, even though it has a fair amount of information on it, it's very simple. Uh, it focuses on their products. There's a lot of white space or close to white space to help to us to understand their products, and it's easy to navigate uh, the different things. There's recognition here rather than recall so that I can see which particular edition you know, I might want to select. It's a very nice interface. All right, let's get to our last two. 
Number nine, help users to recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors. So one thing that is very true is that when you develop a system, when you develop software, a user interface, you find out very quickly that users will find so many ways to do things and break things that you never even expected they would do. Designers often, you know, just scratch their heads and go, wow, that is an interesting error. I never would have even thought about clicking there before you click here because that doesn't make any sense, but your users will find a way to do that. And so we want to provide as much help as possible. This is different than the error prevention. This is after the error has occurred. How do we then fix the problem? Well, hopefully we provide some error messages that are clear and help the users to solve the problem on their own without needing help. So on the, ex on the right, there's an example here where maybe you're filling out a form online, you're creating an account, and there's a field that's required. You know, if you skip that field, you know, maybe it gives you a notification and says, hey, you know, you really need to fill out this field if you want to create an account with us. Or similarly, that's, it's pretty common for uh, there to be rules around passwords. We'll talk more about this later when we talk about security. But oftentimes there'll be some information on, hey, you know, your password doesn't have any of the characteristics that we want it to. It's not long enough. It doesn't have the characters that we require. You know, you'll need to fix that before you create an account with us. And so these error messages hopefully will help uh, those users to, again, figure out what the error is and then know how to, how to solve the problem. And then the last design heuristic it is a fairly straightforward one, but we should provi provide help and documentation to our users. Okay. Now, obviously it's best if the users are, the interface is so good, the recognition rather than recall and everything is so clear that it doesn't require documentation. You know, uh, people really loved the original iPod. Why? Because you could figure out how to use it without reading the instruction manual. Right? So that's, that's good uh, design, user interface and user experience design. But at some point in time, people are going to need help. There's going to be something that's too complex or they're not going to figure out, and it's best to provide that documentation in as clear a method as possible. An example of this is most of our major pieces of software like our office suite software and you know the creative suites from Adobe and things like that most of those uh, have a very standardized method of getting help uh, oftentimes that's represented by this sort of circular question mark icon that's one method of getting help also the F1 function key is is often the kind of the universal uh, button for getting help and it's kind of cool in the in the versions of uh, office if you press the F1 key or, uh, or go to the help, the help is contextual, right? You can go to the general help for Microsoft Office, for example, but if you're doing a particular task and you select help in Microsoft Office, you'll get the help for that particular topic. And so Microsoft, even though they have their own failings when it comes to user interface design, has actually designed their help to be quite good uh, because they have well many users who have needed help over the years and the help is now much much better than it ever has been so let's go to this example this is a piece of software I actually really like this piece of software it's the best piece of software for doing one particular job that sometimes I need to do uh, which is to rename a bunch of files so sometimes I have a bunch of student files for example database project files or something like that and I want to rename them uh, this is a great piece of software for doing that but I want you to think to yourself and evaluate uh, this piece of software on some of the concepts that we've just learned is it easy to recognize rather than recall what I should do next does this have minimalist and aesthetically pleasing user interface design? Does it provide keyboard shortcuts? Well, it's hard to tell on that. Um, but let me just say, this piece of software is exceptionally useful for what it does and super hard to use. 
it doesn't matter how often I use this, I always have to go and look at the documentation. And their documentation is okay, their help is okay. In order to just remember what each of these things does. It's just not a very nicely designed user interface, even though it's a very functional piece of software. All right, let's talk about a couple of other concepts and then, then we'll maybe get to some examples. First of all, prototyping. Prototyping, we've talked a little bit about in, term, in the context of system development, but prototyping also is really popular and really common in user interface design. Now, wh why do we create a prototype uh, instead of creating the, just the user interface design first? Well, because in the long run, it saves us a ton of time and a ton of money. It's relatively easy to perform user interface prototyping. It's not always easy to prototype the whole system, but for user interface, it's often very easy to do. And it helps us to fix a lot of the problems that might exist before we actually commit ourselves to the final development of the project. Now, it's, there's a couple of dimensions uh, to talk about prototypes. One of the dimensions has to do with its fidelity. What I mean by fidelity is the level of detail that exists. And we'll see this more in, in the upcoming slides. Another way, though, of categorizing prototypes, the separate from fidelity, is whether these are horizontal prototypes or vertical prototypes. Here's what I mean by that. A horizontal prototype is very broad. It might show a lot of the different screens, a lot of the different uh, interface, uh, user interfaces, but it doesn't go into much depth on this. Whereas a vertical prototype may not show the widest variety of the user interface, but it does it in great detail. Here's a real life example. A few years ago, a couple years ago actually, uh, Amazon.com redid most of their user interfaces on their apps and also on the website. If you were redesigning that user interface and you were wanting to create a horizontal prototype of that, what you would do is you would create user interface designs that would cover all of the major screens that you're going to experience on the app or on the web for Amazon.com. Maybe the home screen, maybe the account screen, maybe what a product screen looks like. What does the shopping cart screen look like? What does the checkout screen look like? You know, and, and some of the other screens, the music streaming uh, screen. And so you'd look and you'd see a very broad view of the overall uh, set of user interfaces for the site. On the other hand, a vertical prototype might be, let's just look at the shopping cart and checkout functionality. And let's evaluate all of the potential screens and the details of those screens that we would need to for every possible circumstance. What happens if we are removing items from our shopping cart. What does that look like? What happens if we are changing which payment type we're using? What happens if we're using a credit payment versus a gift card payment? What happens if we want to use a promotional code? What happens if we want to change our shipping options? Okay, what are all of the screens associated with all of that? And so that would be a vertical prototype. We're focused on one particular or a few particular features or aspects of a system, but we go into great detail to make sure that we get all of the prototyping done before we build the system. All right, so again, fidelity has to do with the level of detail. So here's an example of a low fidelity prototype. It's sort of like a, uh, you know, scribbles on a napkin kind of idea where you can very quickly, even with someone with the artistic ability that I have, create a overall user interface and then get feedback on that. You know, maybe this is a great design, maybe it's a terrible design, but you can quickly get feedback on this user interface design. Here's another, uh, you know, low fidelity sketch. So for example, this is an application, a very kind of an old music player application. And for whatever reason, the, uh, the designers thought, you know, we want to have a little drop down box in this corner where we can select musical genre. And here's, you know, the, the prototype and how that would actually kind of work from screen to screen to screen. 
And you can very quickly see how this app would, would actually do that. Uh, because this low fidelity prototype gets the functionality across well enough that you can see what's going on. So, we've talked about this already. Doing high fidelity prototyping or traditional methods of creating user interfaces in their, in their fullness often takes a really long time to do it right. Low fidelity prototypes are, are really good enough for most things. We can create very quick sketches and allow for evaluation. The other thing that's cool is we can allow both designers and non-designers uh, to be involved in the process. We can have experiences where, for example, you sit someone down, a potential user or a user at the, at, at the system, show them a sketch and say, hey, you know what? Why don't you just tell us, here's the task we want you to complete with this user interface. Walk us through, talk out loud, and then point to where you would click and, or tap on and, and, and use this, this interface. And then you know, once you tap on something, we'll hand you another uh, low fidelity prototype, another sketch, and you know, that'll be the screen that shows up next. And you can let the designer and other team members watch and see what happens in this circumstance. And you'll notice, oh my goodness, you know, we gave the, the person a task where they are supposed to change their address because they've moved and they need to change their address and we thought that everyone would realize that you get to your account to change your address by pressing this button in the corner but half of our people using the system are pressing somewhere else maybe we need to make that much clearer how to access your account and so non-designers can participate in this process and, and it helps out very quickly to you know nail down what is working and what's not working with the user interface now there's a related concept to uh, prototypes called storyboards. So storyboards are something that comes from the film industry, from film and animation. Animation, <clears throat> and the idea here is you kind of get a a picture view of a script. What's going on? What are the important details of this particular? Uh, you know, movie or scene. And so we can apply this idea of storyboards to user interface design. So let's check out an example. So here is part of a storyboard from a particular movie, all right? So this one, if you're a Star Wars fan, this is episode uh, six, uh, Return of the Jedi. And we can see a little bit about what's going on. Uh, in the next example, oops, in the next example, this is a storyboard that comes from a Pixar movie. Uh, you might have seen Up, and it details a little bit about the the beginning of the movie as uh, you know, as it's kind of starting, and you can see kind of the progression and how the characters interact, and how that might have been, you know, used as a guide to help to build that scene from a, you know more detailed perspective. Now, from a user interface example, here's a very old storyboard, but at least it gets the idea across. So on this screen, you can kind of see, or sorry, in this image, you can kind of see the various screens or the various user interfaces for this chat app. Okay, and again, this is old, but you can see that there's kind of, you know, some, some main, you know, screens up here at the top where you've got, you know, the various different contacts and whether they're available or not and some inter inter or information about them. You can see that if you were to, you know, hover over or click on these icons over here, you might get some more information about them. If you clicked on a, a contact and, and hit message or chat, you, you would go to various different screens where you'd be able to send a message or open up a chat screen. Uh, if you wanted to search and find a particular user, you know, you'd switch, you'd click the, the, the search tab and it would come to here and then you'd put some information in and the search results would show up over here and so you can see as you click and interact with the system that these low fidelity prototypes you can kind of see how the user would flow from one screen to another screen uh, in a storyboard All right, now for, for prototyping, there's a number of different tools available for more high fidelity prototyping. Uh, there's, you know, much, you know, professional uh, tools and things like Visio. One of them that I think is an interesting tool is actually a, a Sacramento-based company, and they have, uh, called Balsamic, 
and they have a very interesting way of doing mocking up. And we could see, you know, lots of different examples that they have here. Uh, but let's flip over to these ones. Here are some of their mobile uh, user interface prototypes. And here are some of their tablet ones. And as it turns out, we could go and if we wanted to, you know, create our own, we could, uh, you know, make a new mockup. We could go. Let's pick iOS. You know, let's choose an iPhone and let's look at some of the different symbols on here oh, let's do a street map and maybe we want to move that around let's do a progress bar maybe we're loading something in here uh, we could put a slider button in here and some of these are starting to look a little bit silly when they put <clears throat> they're put together Maybe we want to have a time picker. Let's get, move these around and we can change. Anyway, you can see quickly that I can go and, and kind of create a fairly, you know, a fairly decent high-ish fidelity prototype fairly quickly, uh, you know, just by moving things around and I can, uh, you know, adjust the alerts, I can adjust the map, I can, you know, kind of get an idea for the various different user interface quite quickly, All right? We can do the same thing with other types of you know applications we could do you know here's a browser window we could create a web page and do the mock-up for that you know and other types of devices as well you know windows uh you know windows form and, and things like that so balsamic is a very nice tool for quickly uh doing prototyping all right now i'll, I'll post a list here uh, usually at this point in class uh, i'll walk us through some of the kind of the notable uh, web designs out there. So this, this list contains a few of the famous, uh, usually considered poor web designs out there. And so if we were to click on a few of these links, you can kind of see that there is a lot going on here. This is a UFO uh, website, and there's just a lot of things going on on this site. It typically, this is actually much better than it used to be. It's very cluttered, it's hard to navigate, there's some challenges here. Uh, this one is, is not as bad as it once was. Now the next one, uh, I'll give you fair warning, this is the art.yale.edu uh, website. They've purposefully made it so that any of their students can edit it at any time. So it changes almost daily or even sometimes hourly, and occasionally it is not really as appropriate uh, in content. So we'll see what it's like today. Oh, this one today it is a nice uh, yellow sh oh nope it's not yellow anymore uh, it's got planet earth okay so that's not as exciting as before but sometimes this one changes every day uh, this is a you know major universities college website and it typically has very poor uh, design this one we'll skip for now uh, let's move to this one's a good one so this is a website where uh, a lot of things are sold. From a user interface design perspective, it tends to be very cluttered, very difficult to figure out. It's got, a, it's got an index over here on the left-hand side, and so I don't need to translate that page now. I think we get the gist of the design, but it's, it doesn't, it's certainly not a minimalistic design. It's hard to figure out where you might find things. There's a few groupings, some things that are sort of grouped together but they don't seem to necessarily relate to each other you know this John Deere tractor here here does it go with this John Deere and it's hard to hard to figure out what's going on here this one tends to be one of one of my favorites hopefully it will work this is a website in the UK where you can rent cars and uh, there is a lot of things going on not sure what the chicken is doing uh, it's walking around. Other things walking around. I don't know if on the video you can hear the sound, but it's uh, there's a lot of things going on. Oh, there's our chicken again. There are many things going on on this side. All right, I, I don't know if I can handle that anymore. <clears throat> And this one is, is an interesting one. It's recently been nominated as, as, a, as a poor website. The question then is, you know, what are they trying to do? What is this, what is this Penny Juice? Who is Penny Juice? Oh, there's some nice, nice user, uh, user uh, testimonials here. 
it's very pretty, it's very colorful, but it's very difficult uh, to even read those. It makes my eyes kind of hurt. I'm going to shut that down for now. All right, so I'll also post these. This is one of the time where uh, I look at, here's the various root beer review uh, sites out there. Some of them have been updated recently, some of them have not. And we usually have a look and evaluate them. So I'm going to leave this to, uh, to your own, um, I'll, I'll put some links up there. But uh, evaluate these and see what you think about these sites. Should I create one? You know, what, uh, you know, what kind of competition do I have from the user interface design perspective? So I leave this uh, as, as an exercise for you to, to apply the principles you've learned to create a user interface design. Because later in the, the semester, we're going to do we're working on the web design project, and you're going to be creating a user interface, or at least adapting uh, an existing user interface. And we'll talk more about that as we go. All right. So that's, that's our class for today. As a reminder, we'll be in the classroom, but we'll doing, be doing a systems development activity and reviewing for our exam, and then next class. And then after that, we'll be in the classroom doing our, our second exam. After the exam, we'll have an online class where we'll be uh, talking about e-commerce, uh, and we'll start to get into social media just a little bit. And so you know, please make sure to do the readings after the exam uh, because we'll have that online class right after the second exam.